Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about, first, a little bit of background related to light and photosynthesis, especially talking a little bit more about lettuce, because our controlled environment agriculture group at Cornell University has a long background with, with lettuce and greenhouse supplemental lighting. Then I'm going to talk about control strategies for lighting, so how to make decisions about when to turn lights on and off. Then I'm going to show you results looking at efficiency of different fixtures, so both high-pressure sodium lights and some different LED lamps, including some new research at Cornell. Then I'm going to show you a little bit about calculations, so you can put your math brain on and maybe pull out a calculator, as well as show you a spreadsheet tool to, so that you can do your own kind of estimating and costs. And finally, show you just a little bit of research from Cornell on calculating the energy cost of growing plants in a greenhouse versus growing them in a plant factory without supplemental light, without sunlight and with only lamp-provided light. So, and I also wanted to point out that I will be talking about mainly photosynthetic light, that is light quantity that we supply for plant biomass accumulation. Of course, light controls so many other processes, so germination, flowering, uh, branching, plant height, so there's a nice body of research that shows that a low far red to red ratio as well as high blue light promotes uh, more compact plants and so on. So it also, also light affects uh, plant secondary compounds as well. So, however, we're not going to be talking about those other factors in this talk. We're going to be focusing on photosynthetic light for, for plant size, for plant biomass accumulation. So here are some work done by A.J. Booth back in the 90s where he looked at uh, the graph shows lettuce. This is days after seeding. This is hydroponically grown lettuce. And then plants were given different daily light integrals, so 8, 10, 14, 16, 20, or 22. And to, for lettuce, this was butterhead lettuce. A uh, marketable plant was considered when it had reached about 150 grams of shoot fresh weight. So that's about five ounces. That would be kind of normal clamshell size hydroponic lettuce. And so the results from AJ demonstrated that you could achieve in about 35 days or even a little bit less sufficient growth of lettuce. Um, and then that, that really went down as you reduce daily light integral. And maybe a, a more clear way to represent that, so this has shoot dry mass on the uh, vertical axis instead of fresh mass, um, but a similar concept. And then here is total accumulated photosynthetically active radiation. So this is if you, if you have um, 10 moles of light per day and you accumulate that for 30 days, you would have 300 moles of light. And if you light for another 30 days, you have 600 moles of light. And so here there was a very clear linear relationship between um, final shoot dry mass and the total accumulated light levels. So for lettuce, the more light we gave the plants, the more biomass they fixed in a larger size plant that you had. This is what lettuce looks like when it does not have enough light. We got this, this um, email to us from someone trying some indoor lighting experiments, and they were not able to achieve very good uh, plant size, and they were wondering if there was a nutrient deficiency um, in their hydroponic solution. And in talking with them, we figured out the problem was, was not a nutrient deficiency. The deficiency that they had was just not enough light for the plant. And then for lettuce, for head lettuce in particular, leaf tip burn can be a large problem. And we see this problem at high light. What it really is, it's a calcium deficiency at the um, growing tip of the plant. And uh, how, the, how come this occurs? It's not because there's a lack of calcium in the nutrient solution typically. It's because the, the new growing point of the plant couldn't get enough calcium. So when plants are growing fast um, with high light, also if they're growing in humid conditions, and as well when the, the plant matures and those outer wrapper leaves kind of surround the inner growth, what happens is you the plant cannot take up enough calcium. It can't transpire enough to get enough um, calcium to that growing shoot tip. And because of this physiological disorder, we typically then have a, le a limit for how much we can light lettuce of about 17 moles of light uh, per meter squared per day. And 
To obtain that 17 mole target, you also have to have pretty good airflow onto the canopy of the plants as well. So this, this shows here a, a vertical airflow fan. So notice it's, it's pointed downward, which is different from our um, horizontal airflow fans that we typically use in greenhouse production. So then with these vertical airflow fans, we can have a DLI target of about 17 moles of light if we don't have these vertical airflow fans, our target needs to be lower, say about 13 moles of light. Otherwise, we run the risk of having our plants develop this tip burn. So I mentioned that 17 mole light. And one concept, and this came out in the question, someone asked if you could kind of take, instead of a daily light integral, if you could average light integral over a week so that you have more of this buffer and that could help you reduce your need for supplemental lighting. What we found for lettuce is that you can take kind of a three-day average of light. And so if, if the average light was about 17 moles over three days, then you wouldn't need to, to supplement a light to see additional benefits. However, we found that same problem with tip burn that if we, if we have 17 moles of light for more than three days in a row, that's typically when we'll run into tip burn, especially as those plants start to, to form heads and reach maturity. Then that said, if you reduce light in, in upstate New York, where I'm from at Cornell University, in our winter conditions, we often have about five moles of light per day. So if we just took our ambient light and did not add supplemental light, it would take about 120 days to go from seed to a market, marketable uh, five ounce head of lettuce. Under those 17 moles of light, we can achieve that in 35 days. Uh, with tomato, as Roberto said, tomato and cucumber are e have even higher light requirements than lettuce in terms of getting optimal yield. And with tomato, again, the rule is sort of 1% more light gives you 1% greater yield. And we certainly found this uh, with an experiment done by our CEA group at Cornell University. These were plants grown, tomato plants grown in the winter time, and we had uh, plants that received lighting up to 10 moles per day, light plus ambient light. And then we had another treatment that had lighting up to 20 moles per day, so ambient light plus lamp light. And we definitely found at least double the yields with that higher light treatment. And as Roberto says, with tomatoes, you can really get up to about 40 moles of light and for optimum yields by tomatoes. So next I want to talk about lighting control strategies. And, and the reason why I want to talk about different lighting control strategies is because light, depending on where you live, can really vary during the course of a year from day to day. This is data from my colleague at Cornell, Lou Albright. So each of these dots is um, the daily light integral for one day. And this was measured over the course of the year for 14 years. So what we find is that um, in the center here, around day, say, 150, 180, that's uh, middle of the summer. So we definitely have our highest daily light integral days uh, there, reaching about 65 moles of light per meter squared per day. But even in the middle of summer, we still have very cloudy days. And so some of those days, we have um, really low light, so 5 moles, 7 moles. And then I wanted to point out that this was outdoor daily light integral. So typical transmittance of light into the greenhouse is only about 70% or even down to 50% of what the outdoor light is. Notice, of course, around the January months, so like day zero to day 30, and then again in December, so like day 330 to day 365, we have many of those really low light days. So we have a few sunny days, where we do get, say, 15 moles of light, but then we have an abundance of those days that we have one, two, three, four, five moles of light per day. So we have then much reduced um, crop growth. And what I wanted to demonstrate with this graph is ideally your lighting control strategy is going to try to smooth out all of this variation so that you can, you can have uniform and predictable daily light integrals in your greenhouse. And that's going to really help somewhat with crop quality, but especially with your crop scheduling. So there's, there's sort of three uh, main light control strategies, at least that I could think of, and you might think of variations on these. Uh, one of those is time clock. 
One of those is instantaneous thresholds um, for light and shade, and another one is, is target daily light integral. And I'm going to go through those in slightly more detail. So in the time clock strategy, this is just using a timer, and you're setting the hours that the lights are on per day. Uh, so this is the simplest strategy. You just need to buy a $20 timer, and you're, you're all set. You plug, you plug your lamps into that. Typically, this would be used during the dark winter months, whatever that would be considered for your climate, say October through March in the north, or November through February in the south. One variation on this is that some growers will then manually turn off the lights if they notice that it's a sunny day. So notice this is very qualitative. It's not, they're not necessarily looking at what the daily light integral is that day and using that to, to make a decision about whether to turn the lights off. It's just sort of qualitatively like, oh, it's a pretty sunny day. I think we can turn off the lights for the plants. So uh, an example then could be the lights would be turned on for 12 hours per day. Uh, maybe what we do is we have them on from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then again in the afternoon until uh, midnight. And so what this does is it, avoid, it avoids maybe the middle of the day when we'd be getting the most natural sunlight. So it should be you know, an effective way to light. And so then maybe our lamps provide 100 micromoles of light per meter squared per second. They're on for 12 hours a day, so it gives us 4.32 moles of light. Um, and you could use Roberto's daily light integral calculator to determine that. So I want to show what happens when you use this strategy. And here's an example from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And what we did is we just took data that's a typical meteorological year data. So this is data that you could obtain for about 1,000 different locations in the US. So we took data from February. And we also assumed that there was 70% light transmission. So of the outdoor light, then only 70% of it is getting into the greenhouse. And what the orange bars show us is the daily light in the grill that we get from the sun. Notice this varies from about 2 moles on some of our lowest days up to about 10 moles on our highest days. Then if we're following that time clock strategy where we get an additional 4.3 moles of light um, from the lamps turning on for 12 hours a day, so that's shown in the gray bar is the 4.32 moles of light. So the total light then is the orange plus the gray bars. And what you'll see is that daily light in the grill is, is quite erratic from day to day. And then I added lines for uh, the yellow line is sort of the target for many floriculture crops versus the purple line is our 17 mole target for lettuce. So what we're seeing is for lettuce, we are never reaching our optimum daily light integral. Um, and in, in uh, many days, we're really missing the target by you know, five moles, seven moles, and so on. So what that's going to do, it's, it's going to delay our harvest by maybe a 40% uh, longer crop cycle, which is then going to really cut into the crop turns that you can have and the output that you can have from your facility. In terms of floriculture crops, you see that we are still not meeting those targets for many of the days as well. So that is also can in some cases delay the, the crop cycle as well as it may reduce um, crop quality. So some of the things that Josh and Roberto talked about, like stem caliper and plant, plant size. Uh, and then here's another example. This one was I took from Atlanta, Georgia. So I was trying to find a southern climate that, that had more light. And this is, again, in February using the typical meteorological year data with 70% light transmission. And what we see is um, now in Atlanta, there are some days where we exceed the, the target for lettuce. So we get more than 17 moles of light per day. And what you see is there's times like day four, five, and six um, and three in February, and then toward the end of the month, where we're exceeding the 17 moles of light target, which for more than three days, which means that those lettuce crops are very likely going to have tip burn and be unmarketable. In terms of the yellow light for floriculture crops, we are still not reaching the target DLIs for some of the days, and then in other days, we're, we're exceeding it. 
so what I was trying to show through these examples was that the time clock method doesn't give you really control over daily light integral. It's a way to add more DLI, but not to really control it. And so when you overlight, that's wasted energy as well. It is could potentially give you tip burn in the case of lettuce. If you underlight, then you have a delayed crop cycle, reduced yield or reduced plant quality. And this also makes things difficult for crop scheduling. Um, so it's unpredictable. A benefit of this method is that no light sensors or computer control are required. So it is the cheapest method to implement. Then the, the next example that I want to share for controlling your lighting decisions is um, using instantaneous uh, thresholds for light and shade. And in this example, we use a computer control system. Um, we have a light sensor. Ideally, this light sensor should be located inside the greenhouse at plant canopy height. So it's really measuring what plants are experiencing. I have, however, seen a lot of greenhouse control systems where they actually install a weather station outdoors and they're using that outdoor light sensor as the um, sensor that's making the lighting decisions. I would propose that's not a good idea and you need a sensor inside the greenhouse for making your lighting decisions. So an example here would be then if, if the sensor measures that, that light is below 200 micromoles per meter squared per second for more than, say, 10 minutes, then the lights will turn on. If it's more than this for 10 minutes, uh, maybe you, you want to have a slightly higher target so that the lights aren't turning on and off all the time. Uh, so maybe we want to make that 300 or 400 micromoles of light. Um, but if, we're, if we have higher light than that, then we'll turn the lights off. So that indicates that we have decent amount of sun. And then if we have greater than, say, 600 micromoles per meter squared per light, then maybe we're closing the shade curtains that so we, we don't want excessive amounts of sunlight, perhaps, which would cause the greenhouse to heat up or maybe lead to high DLIs and tip burn in lettuce. And then a variation on this uh, method is that then after the, the daylight period is over, you would have a DLI target. So then you would continue to light into the evening and the computer control system will turn off the lights once you've reached the DLI target for your crop. And so a benefit of this method is that it does allow you to reach a target daily light integral. So especially using the function where you're then extending lighting into the evening and then turning off automatically once your DLI uh, target has been met. And then if you do have consistent daily light integrals, it does allow you to have consistent crop scheduling. Uh, some negatives with this method are that there are times when you may have excessive light costs. So there, there might be times when you're over lighting. So it, your lighting decisions are based only on instantaneous light, but they're not really predicting what is going to happen in terms of the whole day. And so your lights might turn on, but in fact, the, the second half of the day was a, a really bright day and you would have gotten enough light from the sun if you would have waited. This, this strategy can also overshade, so the shade curtains can be pulled, but then maybe the second half of your day turns out to be uh, a really low light day and you would have kept the shade curtains open earlier in the day so that more natural light would have reached the plants. And then a, a final method, this would, this would be a somewhat more sophisticated control. This is where we use one hour time steps, steps to really target daily light integral. Um, and the example that I'm going to mention is a computer control system developed by my colleague Lou Albright at Cornell University. Um, the acronym that it's called is Light and Shade System Implementation, or LASSIE. So then we get to make jokes about LASSIE coming home and LASSIE saving us, which is great. So in, in this um, control strategy, the computer makes lighting and shading decisions at one hour time steps. And this is also useful for high pressure sodium lamps because they do take about 10 minutes to warm up at a time. So we don't want to make kind of rash lighting decisions and turn them on and off every um, 10 minutes. It's nice to have that somewhat longer time interval. And what this, this method uses is it actually uses um, light measurements from early in the morning to make solar DLI predictions for the whole day. 
and it's it's not perfect, but it actually we find that um, that DLI during the first couple hours in the morning has a fairly strong correlation to DLI over the rest of the day. Then at, at one hour intervals, it makes decisions about shading and lighting, and it delays shading as long as possible um, so that it takes advantage of as much of that natural sunlight as possible. And then it also has a setting where you can take advantage um, for your lighting of nighttime off-peak electricity rates. So if you don't have to worry about issues for photoperiodic plants, let's say a short day plant that you don't want to light during the nighttime, then you can take advantage of those off-peak electricity rates and move as much of your lighting to the nighttime um, hours as possible. So an example then of, of using this Lassie system to control light. So this is Ithaca, New York. This is this is then the number of hours a day that um, supplemental lights had to be turned on in a greenhouse to achieve a 17 mole uh, DLI target. And so we find in the uh, January, February, and again in November and December, we needed in some cases up to about 14 moles of light um, to supplement the ambient light that we received. During the middle of the day, or the middle of the year, so in those summer months, um, really from you know from March into October, there were a few days when we had to add um, quite a bit of supplemental light. But then you'll notice many of those dots are at the very bottom of the graph. So those are days when we had enough um, sunlight um, and did not have to add supplemental light. And movable shade curtains, then, especially for lettuce, where we have the DLI problems, it's really helpful to have movable shade curtains. If we don't have them, this is the DLI using the Lassie control algorithm. So we were able to achieve you know, a minimum of 17 moles of light or close to it for most of the days of the year. But then, then during those middle summer months, we had excessive light in the greenhouse uh, because um, in this case, we didn't have movable shade curtains. So when you implement Lassie to use both rules of both supplemental light and movable shade curtains, th this is what we were able to achieve in a greenhouse. So very close to the 17 moles of light um, target for, for almost all days of the year. And one of our team members in the CEA group, Kale Harbeck, has calculated the savings from using a sophisticated control like Lassie, so a daily light integral control, instead of using the instantaneous light and shade control. And he found that uh, in Atlanta, you would save, you would reduce the amount of, of supplemental lighting by 36% per year. So this would be due to um, overshading often. And then in Helena, 17% savings, Minneapolis, 19%, and Elmira, New York, which is close to Ithaca, New York, 14%. So there can be some real savings in energy use if you take a concerted effort of looking at your control strategies. And Kale from our group has formed his own startup company called Greenhouse Logic. You can find it at greenhouselogic.com. They provide um, energy audits um, as well as energy modeling and calculations for you, um, as well as implementing the Lassie light and shade control algorithm in your greenhouse operation. So next, then, I want to move into an economic analysis of greenhouse lighting and how to do some of these um, calculations for yourself, um, as well as comparing uh, LED lamps to high-pressure sodium lamps. Um, and what I consider is the, the reference in comparing LED lamps to high pressure sodium lamps was published in 2014, so two years old now, um, by um, Bruce Bugby and his grad student um, at Utah State University. Um, so they did a very nice job of looking at uh, maybe 20 different lamps and measuring their light output of the lamps uh, as well, and then dividing that by the, um, the energy usage of those lamps to calculate light efficiency. Um, and this paper is, is um, freely available. Um, so it's one of those rare scientific publications that, that anyone can download for free. And to summarize the findings of Nelson and Bugby um, is that um, there have been a lot of improvements in um, efficiency, um, even in high pressure sodium lamps in recent years. So um, the kind of uh, legacy lights that we used in the past had magnetic ballasts. Um, those consumed a lot of energy, and so those lights were somewhat less efficient. Um, so, so moving from a magnetic, magnetic ballast into an electronic ballast has helped the situation. 
um, but then um, the bulbs have become more efficient as well. So our traditional high pressure sodium lamps have a single filament in them, they're single ended. The, the new high pressure sodium lamps have a, a double ended uh, filament um, and they're actually more efficient. So then par efficiency, this is micromoles of light that are outputted in, in par, so for, between 400 and 700 nanometers um, per joule of energy. So notice for those um, the sort of older high pressure sodium lamps, we got only 0.94 micromoles per joule, and then we almost doubled that with some of the new high pressure sodium um, light technology. So we got uh, 1.70. Uh, metal halide lights um, had similar efficiency to the, the high pressure sodium lights that had the single ended um, filaments, so 1.34 to 1.44. And then there, there were numerous different um, LED fixtures that were examined in this study, and their efficiency really varied by fixture. So on the low end was 0.89, but on the high end got up to 1.70. And so in this study, at least in uh, 2014, one take home message then was that the efficiency of the best LED lamps um, was as good as the efficiency as the best high pressure sodium lamps. Our group at Cornell has been um, taking a look at this ourselves so that we can add some, some new data to this. Uh, so this would be data that has been collected now in the last few months uh, from comparing uh, a few different um, LED fixtures to high pressure sodium fixtures in terms of their light efficiency. Um, and so far we have looked at um, six different lamps in the study. A.J. Booth, a colleague at Rutgers University, he has the facilities for measuring the, the light output um, and uh, electrical consumption. So he is an integrating light sphere at Rutgers University that we've been using for this study. So I want to point out the, the six lamps that we've tested. Um, one has been a double-ended high-pressure sodium lamp. Um, another one was a single-ended high-pressure sodium lamp. And then we looked at four different LED lamps. Um, these were the Illumitex Power Harvest, so that would be a point source lamp. Lighting Technologies, which is more of a bar type lamp. Um, and so its power consumption was only about 100 per lamp. The Lumigro Pro, which is again a point source lamp. And then the Valoya um, R150 lamp, um, which is a small point source uh, lamp. So you'll notice um, I have power consumption here. So this is the number of watts of energy that they took, um, which we call wall plug um, power usage. Is, is the whole lamp plugged in. Um, so that accounts for ballast um, electrical usage and driver electrical usage in the case of LEDs. Then, um, then you'll see the, the column on the right that we added in here is light output. Um, so this is total light output from the lamp as measured in the integrating light sphere. Um, and so, uh, so notice that the um, power source uh, lamp, the double-ended HPS, had the highest light output. This is in micromoles per second, so micromoles of photosynthetically active light per second. Um, and then that went down to to 109 for the lighting technologies lamp. Um, of course, the lighting technologies lamp only used 100 watts of energy versus the power source lamp used um, 1,077 um, watts of electricity. Um, so then what, what you want to do to calculate efficiency is you take light output and you divide it by power consumption, um, and that gives us power efficiency. So here are the two columns on the right are are PAR efficiency, so photosynthetically active radiation efficiency. Um, I just presented those numbers in two different units. So the, the correct scientific units are micromoles per joule, but I like to, I like to look at them instead uh, in moles per kilowatt hour. So this tells you moles of light um, per kilowatt hour of electricity. So that's kind of easier to think about kilowatt hours. Um, what we found uh, of the six lamps that we examined is the the high pressure sodium lamp that had the highest efficiency was the, the PAR source AgroSun double ended lamp uh, with a PAR efficiency of 1.59 micromoles per joule. Um, and actually, the other lamp that was not a double ended, the Gavita Pro, had a, a quite similar PAR efficiency. And then of the LED lamps that we looked at, um, one of those had higher PAR efficiency than the high pressure sodium lamps, and that was the um, power harvest lamp from Illumitex. 
Okay, and so those were um, electrical uh, uh, light output and electrical consumption measurements. We currently have the lamp set up um, at Cornell University, um, and um, and we're moving in hydroponic ponds under the lamps, um, and we're comparing actual um, plant yields where the lamps are used for supplemental lighting in a greenhouse. Um, and we suspect that there's not going to be huge wavelength effects of the lamps um, because we do have the ambient um, sunlight to kind of wash out those effects, but, but we will be studying that in the experiment. So in this trial, um, all of the lamps, their, their height has been adjusted so that they're going to provide 200 micromoles per meter squared per second of light um, at plant canopy height, and then they're going to have light sensors under them connected to the Lassie control system to control to a, a constant um, daily light integral of 17 moles per day. Um, so I hope by um, the time of Cultivate this July that I can report back the results from, from that study. Okay, so in a few minutes remaining, I want to talk very briefly about uh, doing some of your own light calculations. Um, so one question that growers will ask me is how much area can one fixture light? And if you know two pieces of information, you can calculate this. So you need to know the light output that either needs to come from the light manufacturer or needs to come from um, an independent lab, like the, the book B and Nelson data um, or the data that I just mentioned from AJ Booth. Um, so if you know the light output and then you know your target um, amount of instantaneous light, let's say um, for lettuce in New York, my target is 200 micromoles of light. Um, so then you divide the two. So in this case, um, 1712 is our light output. Uh, we divide that by 200 uh, micromoles as our instantaneous light target, and we get the answer of 8.56. Now this is in square meters, um, so we have to multiply by like 10.7 something to uh, put that in terms of square feet. So this, this lamp can potentially light 92 square feet um, in the greenhouse uh, and provide 200 micromoles of light. Um, however, this is, um, this is sort of a ballpark estimate um, because it doesn't take into account the pattern of light under that lamp. And so um, as one of the, the previous questions that came in with a point source light, you tend to have uh, a greater pool of light, so higher light intensity directly under the lamp and less around the edges. Um, so that has to be taken into account if you want kind of a real answer to the question. Then a grower will ask me, okay, so I buy this lamp and I plug it in. How much is it going to cost me to run that lamp for a year? So to answer this question, we need to know how many watts of power the lamp is consuming and then how many hours um, that lamp is going to be on per year. So in this example, um, we have that double-ended high-pressure sodium lamp. It uh, uses um, 1,077 watts um, in Ithaca, New York, we found for lettuce to, to reach that 17 mole target um, and reach it every day of the year, our lights are on um, for about 2,600 hours a year. Um, we've actually found that in eastern New York, so on Long Island, where they get a lot more light during the winter time, or in the mid-Atlantic states, that the number of hours it needs to be on is, is only about half of this. Uh, but this is our example for Ithaca. Um, so we take the power times the hours it's on per year, and we divide it by 1,000 to convert watts to watts. So we come up with 2,790. Uh, so this is the electricity cost per square foot per year. Um, so $3 per square foot per year. So um, if you go to our Cornell CEA website, if you don't want to do all of these calculations by hand, um, I have developed this Excel tool. Um, we could consider it probably like an alpha version of the Excel, uh, an alpha version. So feel free to give me your input and I can add in other functionality to this calculator tool. But go to cornellcea.com and on the right side, you're going to see the link to that. So in this um, tool, we're calculating the lamps that we need um, in a greenhouse, or estimating that, and then uh, estimating the cost of electricity. So we put in the target instantaneous light intensity. Um, and the two pieces of information that we need from the lamp are the lamp um, output, so it's light output, um, and that can come from the manufacturer or from the Bugby and Nelson data. Um, the area that we're lighting, so in this case, we're lighting a one-acre greenhouse. Um, and then from the lamp, we also need to know the efficiency, or another term is the efficacy of the lamp. 
Um, so we plug that in. Um, here we're going to say we get 10% light loss from edge effects, or sometimes you need slightly more lights so that you get a uniform distribution of light. Um, so we're accounting for that. Um, and then the lights are on for, on average, seven hours per day. Um, where I got that is I used that 2,600 hours per year number that we knew for, for lettuce um, in Ithaca, New York, and divided that by 365 days a year. So on average, the lights are on for about seven hours a day. And then I plugged in our price for electricity. Um, and then the output that this calculator is going to give you, it'll tell you the square meters that you're lighting, um, the lamp power consumption, the lamps that you need with and without edge effects, um, the daily light integral that the plant, that those lamps supply. Um, so using that number of lamps times um, the number of hours they're on a day. Then it calculates the kilowatt hours of electricity used to light that whole area. Um, and then the cost of that. So in this case, to light that one acre for a year is $143,000. Um, and then electricity costs per square foot per year would be $3.29. Okay, so I'm not gonna review these in detail because you have these um, in the, the um, handouts from the webinar today, but you can see the, the, um, the electricity cost to light an acre, as well as the cost to light um, per dollars per square foot per year. Um, and I did want to note, uh, just like uh, was said before, um, greenhouse lighting plans from lighting professionals are ultimately what you need in the end to make sure that you have uniform distribution of light and um, proper number of lamps. So PL Light Systems, which is a sponsor of this webinar, um, uh, has a, a tool where you go online and you input information about the, the um, like height of your uh, gutter height in your greenhouse um, and the area of the greenhouse and so on, and your target light values, and then they can work with you to come up with a professional lighting plan. So uh, as I'm running out of time here, I'll try to be quick. So um, I talked a lot about um, efficiency of photosynthetically active light. That should be, a, of course, a primary consideration when choosing new lights. Um, of course, you'll also need to consider cost of the lights themselves, the lamp life, the bulb replacement cost in the case of high pressure sodium lights. In the case of LED lamps, you have to replace the whole fixture, um, but they, they theoretically have a much longer lifespan. Um, the installation cost, um, some of the fixtures have a bigger footprint than others, and so they, they actually shade a lot, um, and the uniformity of the light plan. And wavelength uh, may be more important, especially for those um, completely indoor applications, uh, like Josh was talking about, like lighting plugs um, in an indoor growing environment. This was just a, a funny example of lights. Um, these were experimental LED lamps I saw used in a greenhouse. And if you look at them from above, you see the tremendous amount of shading that they provided. Um, and uh, I thought that was an unacceptable amount of shading that we would have gotten from the lights. Um, and then um, just a few slides about energy consumption. So um, Kale, one of our team members that I mentioned, has spent his, the last year of his life doing um, energy models. And he's looked at costs of um, uh, greenhouse energy, so lighting and heating and air ventilation versus growing indoors in a plant factory. Um, and I'm going to cut right to the chase. So this is uh, energy. Uh, consumption, uh, energy use intensity in um, kilo BTUs per square foot per year. Um, PF means plant factory, and he compared a couple different scenarios. Uh, plant factory one, plant factory two uses more outside air ventilation uh, when it gets too warm. Um, and then in the greenhouse scenarios, greenhouse one um, was, was one scenario, greenhouse two is where we had more strict um, humidity control in the greenhouse. So we had to do kind of a lot of waste heating where we vent um, and then heat to control humidity. Um, and he's done this now for different locations in the US, but the graphs here just show uh, three different locations in New York, Albany, Buffalo, and New York City. And what we find is that um, of course, in the plant factory, we need a lot more energy for lighting than we do in the, the greenhouse environment. Um, interestingly, we need still some heating in plant factories, and we found that this is because of plant transpiration. So as the plants uh, transpire, so water enters the air, um, and we have to turn on HVAC chilling in a plant factory to um, remove that humidity from the air. Um, and sometimes that actually 
uh, provides excessive amounts of cooling and then we have to go back in and heat. Um, and then there's other times of the year where we do need to, to cool and use those chillers uh, to compensate for light. So lots of, lots of idiosyncrasies here, um, uh, which is why we have this model that we're going to make publicly available so that you can look at your own parameters and your own set points. Um, and then ultimately he calculated carbon footprint or carbon dioxide that uh, was consumed um, for the electricity for lighting and, and chilling as well as um, the, the CO2 from, from heating. Um, and we find that depending on location and scenario, um, there was about a two to four times higher carbon footprint. Um, okay, then uh, if you want to also learn more about um, growing in plant factories, my colleague Lou Albright um, gave a talk on this a, a few years ago, and he does have an updated slide set to take into account um, some of the, the most efficient lights that are currently available. Um, if you go to cornellcea.com and Hot Topics, you can see that. Um, okay, and visit cornellcea.com. And at this point, I'd like to conclude my presentation. I, I would like to thank um, PL Light Systems for sponsoring uh, this webinar today. Um, and now I'd like to um, open it up for questions.